on Sky News Business. This is the next five years with Bernard Salt. Hello and welcome to the next five years on Bernard Salt. We may be a nation abundant with energy resources, but we're also a nation that struggles with the cost of providing power to its people. And now we're at a crossroads with industry players and state and federal governments all doing their best to shape Australia's energy plan for the next five years. It's almost a year since the Hazelwood coal-fired power station was closed in Victoria. And a lot has happened in that time. Wholesale electricity prices have skyrocketed, sending power prices to their highest levels ever across Australia. The chief scientist, Alan Finkel, has issued no less than 50 recommendations to fix the mess. South Australia now has the world's largest battery connected to the grid, courtesy of the American entrepreneur Elon Musk. The newly established Energy Security Board has tabled a bold new national energy guarantee to navigate a way forward. And the federal government is of course right now working hard to convince the states to endorse the guarantee as a way of resolving the deadlock. The National Energy Guarantee is Australia's first real attempt to bring energy and climate change policy together. So far, both industry and consumer groups appear to be largely supportive of the guarantee's broad intent. But some questions still linger. Will the guarantee bring down electricity costs quickly enough to help hurting businesses and consumers? And will the guarantee achieve the certainty our nation needs in the energy space? Tonight, on the next five years, we discuss the complex issue of energy, as well as the politics and the aspiration behind the National Energy Guarantee. Our panel tonight includes Frank Calabria, the CEO of Origin Energy, which is an integrated energy business in generation, renewables and retail. Lynn Gallagher, Director of Research Energy Consumers Australia, and Ted Surrett, KPMG Australia's energy and resources leader. But we begin with Energy Minister Josh Frydenberg, who this week sent a strong message to energy retailers that they're expected to pass on to their consumers in full the savings from a recent drop in wholesale energy prices. Mr Frydenberg attributes the fall to the government's recent intervention in the gas markets, as well as to investments in energy infrastructure. The opposition believes these lower prices are more to do with renewable sources, coming online in fact. But for the longer term, the government believes that its national energy guarantee policy will form the basis to a sustainable drop in prices eventually and to increased reliability and to a drop in emissions. It's a policy that not everyone is comfortable with. Minister, why do you think the National Energy Guarantee is a workable solution to our energy problems? Well, the National Energy Guarantee offers the first real opportunity in more than a decade to integrate climate and energy policy, and that is needed to provide investment certainty so that the businesses that make 20, 30, 40 year bets on the type of generation that the grid needs will have the level of certainty so that they can make that investment knowing the returns that they will make. This is the theory and this is the idea and it sounds terrific, but we need to actually put it into practice. Sure. Walk me through how this is going to work in practice. How are we going to get this across the line? Well, how the are you going to get it across well, the, the line? Well, the first thing to say, Bernard, is that it is the recommendation of the independent experts. The Energy Security Board, which is made up of the heads of the Australian Energy Market Commission, the Australian Energy Regulator and the Australian Energy Market Operator, an independent chair and an independent deputy chair. And what they have recommended and what we have accepted as a government is two new obligations on the retailers. The first obligation requires a certain amount of dispatchable power from the retailers. And so that means that they will have a type of energy be, that they will sell into the market that is available on demand, not because of the weather, so irrespective if it's cloudy or if it's sunny or if it's windy, but can be supplied on demand. Now that could be coal, gas, hydropower, sun, uh, solar power, wind power and storage 
and demand response. But this is unlikely to be new coal, so it's existing coal. Is that well, right? Well, you you'd never rule out new coal, but what it does offer is an opportunity for companies to invest in dispatchable power because that will now be a obligation on the retailers. The second obligation relates to the emissions intensity of the portfolio of assets that the retailer is responsible for. And that emissions intensity will be consistent with the government's Paris commitment, which is to reduce our emissions by 26 to 28 per cent by 2030 on 2005 levels. This idea uh, of the National Energy Guarantee, is it modelled on anything that is in practice uh, overseas or are we really creating something new here? Well, we are creating something innovative and elegant, to use the words of Bloomberg Energy Finance, and we have come up with a model that has been widely lauded by the big energy users, like the Blue Scopes, the BHPs, the Rio Tintos, the Dow Chemicals, as well as the energy producers, the Origins, the Energy Australias uh, and the AGLs and the like. Um, this is a world leading mechanism. It's one that has received widespread acceptance and I think people now recognise it's the only game in town. In my reading on this subject, there's been some concern about what is called unintended consequences of the NEG, the National Energy Guarantee. Walk me through what they mean by unintended consequences and how we're going to address those. Well, you'd have to ask them, Bernard, <laughs> because the reality is we're consulting extensively with the key stakeholders to prevent or avoid any unintended consequences. I mean, issues that have been raised, uh, particularly around market concentration and how this will impact the future shape of the market and we are very focused on ensuring that we encourage competition because ultimately more competition leads to lower prices and the modelling that we have already done uh, on the National Energy Guarantee shows that Australian average households will be around uh, $300 a year better off than they would be under the Labor Party's plan and that the wholesale price will be around 23% lower which for some operating business with a supermarket, for example, could mean a $400,000 saving on their power bill, or if you're a big energy user like a chemical factory, a million dollars a year. But as I understand it, in order to get this across the line, you need all, not just the suppliers and the retailers, but you also need the states on board. Yes. You have a big meeting coming up uh, with COAG in April where you need all the states on board. Is it possible that one state could hold out and does that have a negative impact on the ability to deliver the NEG? Well, we're talking about the national electricity market, which technically does not include Western Australia and the Northern Territory. So you need those other jurisdictions to sign on to change the national electricity market rules. Uh, so far, the response has been very positive. Uh, New South Wales, which is the largest economy, uh, among the states has been strongly supportive. Tasmania, um, the new Queensland Energy Minister has talked about the certainty that the National Energy Guarantee would bring. Victoria uh, supported further work being undertaken at the last COAG Energy Council meeting on the National Energy Guarantee and not following a recommendation put by South Australia for work on other models. And obviously Jay Weatherall has probably been the mount most outspoken uh, critic uh, of the National Energy Guarantee, but let's see what happens in the upcoming election. Uh, yes, that election is, is in March and the COAG meeting is in April. Correct. So you're not quite sure who you're going to be dealing with at that, uh, at that meeting. Um, uh, you've talked about uh, how this is going to play out over the next year or so. Walk me through the next two years uh, before, over, over the period during which after which we're going to get the reduced power prices. Are we at a situation at the moment where power prices are, are at, their, at their peak and will diminish over the next two years and then diminish further beyond that? Walk me through that, uh, that logic. Well, the Australian Energy Market Commission has said that power prices will come down over the next two years. And the rationale... In either the, case. And the, the rationale for that is there is some $12 billion worth of investment either committed or underway 
focused mainly around renewables. And that investment will bring more generation to the market and the laws of supply and demand mean the more supply, uh, the, lower the lower the price. So we're going through peak power pain right now? Well, I'm certainly working towards lowering power prices. Now, as you would be aware, there are lots of uh, components to a household or business power bill. Generation costs are one component, around 30%, but another big component are the network costs, which make up nearly 50% of the power bill. And we have successfully passed through the Parliament last year legislation to abolish the ability of the network companies to challenge the decision of the Australian Energy Regulator. If that had been done previously by the Labor Party, that would have saved consumers six and a half billion dollars. So we have now done that and that will save billions of dollars in the future. The retail component is also important in the bill because the margins are pretty high there and we have reached agreement with the retailers to provide a lot more uh, simple information, comparable information to customers so that they can shop around and get a better deal and in doing so save themselves hundreds of dollars because the Australian Energy Regulator has told us that the uh, average household has not moved uh, contract or retailers in the last five years. Uh, just uh, one final question very quickly. Just project yourself forward five years. This is the program called The Next Five Years, 2023. What are the key issues that would be confronted by your successor, Minister for, for Energy, uh, in this position uh, for the 2020s? What's the big issue that lies beyond uh, the uh, National Energy Guarantee? Well, it's all about managing this period of disruption because there's a rapid a change and transformation going on in energy markets. As we uh, move away from synchronous generation to more intermittent sources of, in, uh, of generation, particularly wind and solar, storage is going to be key. We're investing in Snowy 2.0, which is the largest such pumped hydro project of its kind, but storage will be a big issue. The digitalisation of energy will be key because people through their handheld device will be able to monitor and moderate their their demand for energy depending on the price that is being offered. We'll also see a lot more decentralisation in the system, more microgrids, what is uh, um, uh, basically seeing uh, little areas where their own power generation supplying um, their own needs uh, and that will happen more and more as homes develop their own solar panels with their own battery storage and are less reliant on a centralised system. So business can have confidence in the future and invest in the future for the 2020s? Absolutely, and energy is an indispensable, uh, uh, indispensable uh, need for, for the public and our job is to get affordable, reliable power as we meet our international uh, commitments. That's great to hear. Thanks very much, Josh Reidenberg. Good to be with you. Thank you.